above every name. The name at which demons tremble. The name at which, oh God, heaven, we have, we have access to your very throne. This morning, I ask in Jesus' name for a spirit of revelation and a spirit of wisdom. I pray for insight, understanding your word in a new and fresh way. I pray that hearts will be inclined to you, ears opened, and your beloved will behold wondrous things from your word today. Holy Spirit, come and convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Come and explain and the scriptures to us. Let it be sweet to us, O oh Lord, as we take it in. And just give us the insight you desire. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. I ask for the unction, the anointing. May it increase more and more. In Jesus' name and the beloved together said, Amen. Praise God. So this letter was specifically to the letter of Sardis, the, 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 in the city of, to the church of Sardis. And Sardis was one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation that Jesus sent his letters to and shared his heart to. Now, Sardis was in Asia Minor, like all the other seven churches, which is modern-day Turkey. And the capital, it was the capital province of, of Lydia. It was about 80 kilometers from another town called Smyrna, which Jesus actually commanded in the letter. And it was a well-fortified city. It was a prosperous city. It was easily defendable. You know, but they, there was one lapse in the, in, in the life of that church that affected them greatly. What happened was at night, they all went to bed and they, they forgot to basically guard that city. And the enemy took them out just like that. So it's interesting what Jesus says to this particular city. But it became an important Christian center. Um, and, but then this Christian center became very complacent as well and began to live in its past glory. So this is sort of the historical background. But let's just read from the book of Revelation chapter, one, chapter 3 from verse 1. It says, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write. Now I'll be talking about the angels of the churches in another sermon. You want to know what, who the angels are. Are they literal angels or are they what most people believe to be pastors? So praise God, your pastor is an angel. Amen. Anyway, so it says, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. This is also quite interesting, the seven spirits of God. We see in the book of Isaiah chapter 11 where it talks about Messiah having the spirit of the Lord, having the spirit of counsel, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, and the spirit of might, seven spirits. So he's just, he's basically the embodiment of the Holy Spirit. But it says, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. I know the stuff you've been up to. I know your activities. I know your deeds. That you have a name. That you are alive, but you are dead. Whoa. That's pretty stern. You have a name. You have a reputation that you're alive. That he says, but you're actually dead. Then he says this, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I'll come upon you. And this was really making reference to something that happened in Sardis. You remember I said that there were one particular evening, they were all asleep. They forgot their, their guard was down, and the en enemy was able to take them that way, okay? So Jesus is making reference to this, you know, that he'll come as a thief, and you will not know what hour I'll come for you. Come upon you. It says, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. Folks, there's always a remnant. There's always a remnant. God always has a remnant somewhere. Sometimes things seem really bad. You know, it's like everybody's asleep in the church. Things are, are not going the way it should, but there's always a remnant. Say a remnant. And here he points out that you have a few, that's a remnant, names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes, now this is always typical of the letters, he always brings in a, a word of encouragement so that people persevere, the church perseveres. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Amen. So some powerful stuff that Jesus shared with the church 
of Sardis. Some powerful stuff here. Now let's get into it a little bit. He says in verse 1 of Revelation 3, to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive. You have a name. You have a name. You have a reputation that you're alive. You have a reputation that you're alive, but actually you're dead. Now, the NIV puts the word reputation. Other versions say reputation. I think it gives the same sort of idea. You have a name. You've got, you know, there's something about you that people talk about, you know. But Jesus is saying, in my assessment, you're actually dead, you know. And, and then it's quite interesting because the thing about reputation is that reputation is a common opinion that people have about someone. That's what, you, you know, if you have a reputation, it could be a good reputation, it could be a bad reputation. I hope you have a good reputation, amen. But notice he says you have a reputation, you have a name. There's something, there's something about your name, you know, maybe it's, it's like, it's almost like you're a no, you're nominal Christian. So, you're, 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 you know, nominal means existing as something in name only, not actual or real. So he says you have a name, you have a reputation, but you're dead. Now Jesus says, I know what you've been up to. Folks, he knows what we've been up to as a church. And he knows what we, he's been, we've been up to as individuals. He knows even when people don't see, he knows what you've been up to. Amen? He says, I know your works and your deeds. This church was an active church. It wasn't a dormant church, you know, in, in, in terms of the way, the, the activities. It was obviously an active church. They were not inactive in any way. It was a happening church. You know, sometimes there are churches that you, you go to and, man, there's a lot of activities. Things are happening for couples. Things are happening for the youth. Things are happening. It was a happening church. And there's nothing wrong with a happening church. I'm just trying to say that probably this church was, had so many activities going. On the surface, people saw this church of status as being full of life, full of activity, vibrant and flourishing. That's how people perceived Sardis. You know, they had a reputation in the community. They were well known in the community. They had a range of impressive programs and, and activities for the community. But the Lord wasn't particularly impressed with this church. He said the church was dead. He said, you have a name of being alive, but folks, you're dead. Now, this is Jesus talking to his beloved. He's talking to his precious, precious, beloved church. He says, you've got a name, folks, but you're actually dead. This church impressed the community, but it didn't impress the Lord. Now, Jesus, the thing about Jesus was that Jesus was a straight shooter. He said things the way they were. In fact, in today's culture, a lot of people would not have gotten on with Jesus. I'm telling you the truth. Look at what he tells the religious leaders in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27. These are the religious leaders. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. That's Jesus. He says, you guys look nice on the outside, but you're like whitewashed tombs. That's Jesus. He said it as it was. And this church started, they had a name of being alive. Really, his church was dead. I want to ask you a question here. What reputation do you have with God? What reputation do you have with God? How does God perceive your actions and your deeds? Would he have a thumbs up when he looks at you and says, oh, Pastor Bob, that's my man. Or will he have a thumbs down? When he looks at your Facebook page, would he... Like it. When you tweet, would he retweet it? What perception does he have of you? The things you're up to. When nobody's looking. Hallelujah. You see, it's better to have a good reputation with God than a good reputation with man. Amen. It's better to, to have a rep, it's better to have a good reputation with God than a good reputation with the community. It's better to have honor with God than honor with man. The bottom line is, how does God perceive you? Amen? The true state of the church of Sardis is that it was, although it had so much activity, that church was really dead. Paul warns us that it's possible to have a form of godliness without the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And that's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. It's possible to appear spiritual without being spiritual. It's possible to seem religious and be dead inside without the life of the Holy Spirit. It's possible. And Jesus said that to the, hip, the, the, the Pharisees and the, and the scribes, the teachers of the law. And he said that to his church, his church in, in, um, in Sardis. He said that. The church was probably going through the motions without really carrying out the activities from a place of faith and a place of love. They were not living in, in, in expectancy of Christ's return in terms of hope. And I'm going to get to touch on those a few times. You see, the Bible tells in the book of Romans chapter 14 to verse 23, it says, whatever, anything that is done without, sin, without faith is sin. In other words, our actions should be motivated from a place of faith. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It says anything that is not done from a place of faith is sin. And all, the scripture says that without faith, it, we cannot please God. In other words, when you're doing stuff and it's, the real basis is not from a place of faith, you're not doing it by faith, then it's not really pleasing God. He says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Also, without love, God is not impressed with the stuff we do. Without love, God is not impressed. If the motivation is not really the love of God for people, he's not impressed. I'll give you the scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, how many of you would be impressed with that? If somebody could speak every single language on this planet and the language of angels, we would be impressed. But look what the Bible says. But if I didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. God is not impressed. If I had the gift of prophecy and I had I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. So faith has to be working through love, which is what the Bible says. In terms of our activities and our actions and the things we do, check yourself and see, am I really motivated? Am I in a place of faith acting through love? Now, the question is this. What is a spiritually dead church? Now, it's quite interesting because as you research the, um, you know, the scriptures and you research what, what a lot of scholars have done, there's so many different scholars that know exactly what a dead church looks like. There are characteristics of a dead church. Some people say there are five characteristics of a dead church and they just name them. There are ten, I noticed in my research, there were seven characteristics of a dead church and then there were still ten characteristics of a dead church. You know, so just let me give you a few here and then I'll give you the characteristics that I, I felt the Holy Spirit give me. Is that okay? Help me out a little. Is that okay? Okay. And somebody called Eric... Um, Perkins, he says this, the marks of a dead church. A dead church worships in the past. That's interesting. I'm not going to elaborate too much. He also says a dead church is inflexible and resistant to change. How true it is when sometimes denominations are not willing to embrace something new. I remember when drums started coming to churches and, and guitars and people said, no, 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 you can't bring the world into the church. I read an article of somebody who was talking about resisting, you know, the, he was in a church, and this was in the 19, 1990s, and when they initially brought the projector, video projector, people were saying, we, we didn't come to church to watch videos, you know, but, but that's a mark of a dying church when people resist change. A dead church often has carnal and lazy leadership. That's why you got to pray for your leaders, amen? A dead church neglects children and youth, and that is so true. It neglects children and youth. A dead church lacks evangelistic and missionary zeal. In other words, it's inward looking. That's somebody's, you know, characteristic. But there are so many different characteristics that I don't want to really go into. Now, the, I want to, sh to just mention this, that today's statistics show an alarming number of churches dwindling in size and closing down completely. They are dying. Even though they have well-meaning programs and they have a lot of activities going. You know, I'm not going to mention any church by name, but there's one of, and this is an article from the Globe and Mail, written, I believe she's a non-Christian, but this is an article from the Globe and Mail. Let me just read a little bit here. One of Canada's largest Protestant denominations is now closing about one church a week. A week. In the past decade, it has shut down more than 400 churches. 
It's a dramatic reversal from 50 years ago when the denomination formed in 1925 was riding a wave, opening a new church a week, sometimes two or three. But now it's closing a church every single week. I would say there's something wrong. That church is dying. That church is dying. You see, Christ's church, his body, Christ's church is his body, right? The Bible says that the church is the body of Christ. It has to be full of life. It has to be vibrant. The Bible says in Romans 8, 2, that the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, it's a spirit of life, not a spirit of death. It says the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now, folks, sin has something to do with that death. Sin. The scriptures tell us that the word of God is the word of life. I'm now giving you what I perceive to be critical in any church and in any individual who wants the life of God. Are you hearing me? Okay? So we, the first thing is this. The has, you have to be in a place where you have the life of God. Okay? And the Bible says that the word of God is the word of life. The word of God is the word of life. That's in Philippians 2.16. In fact, the Bible says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And, and John chapter 1 verse 14 says, and the word became flesh. So the word was manifest in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? And the Bible says the word is life. So the word is critical. Say the word is critical. Turn to somebody and say the word is life. The Bible says that Jesus has the words of eternal life. Jesus has the words of eternal life. That's in John chapter 6, verse 68. It says, this is Peter speaking, you have the words of eternal life. So the word is critical. If we leave out the message of Jesus from our churches, we are positioning ourselves for death. Why? Because Jesus is life. So if you start leaving a whole chunk of the message of Jesus Christ, you are, you are sucking the life out of that church. Why? Jesus is the way, he's the truth, and he's the, he's the life. So Jesus is central. Even if you're preaching from Leviticus, make sure somehow it ties in with Jesus. If you're preaching some, par some stories from the Old Testament, and, I, and this is something that somebody shared with me, you know, I think it was a, a, some years ago. Always see how it applies in the New Testament. See how Jesus can, you know, what is the relevance in terms of the person of Jesus Christ? We've got to be preaching Jesus Christ. You've got to be hearing things about Jesus Christ. Sometimes there's all sorts of philosophies and all sorts of things on the internet that people get into. Folks, is it talking about Jesus? Because that's what's going to give you life. He's going to give you life. Amen? No wonder Paul unashamedly declared, I don't preach myself. We don't preach ourselves. We preach Jesus Christ. In verse 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. That's who we preach, Christ Jesus. If you're going to any church and you don't hear the name of Jesus Christ, things pointing to Jesus Christ, you don't hear the word preach, folks, you want to get, make sure that you know whether you're supposed to be in that church. You want to make sure. Because if there isn't the preaching of Christ, then there's life that is being sucked out at a great level out of that church. Amen? Also, if we do not preach the word of God, in our churches, we're positioning ourselves for death because his word gives life. His word gives life. Is there an emphasis on the word of God? Do they refer to scriptures? <laughs> Sometimes some people can motivate you. They can get you on the feet. But is it from the scripture? Is it from the scripture? Where is it in the scripture? That's why at River of Life, we do everything we can to show you the scriptures. The Bible says, even God himself has exalted his word above his name. Is it from the word of God? Because his word gives life. Can I hear a good amen? Now, the next important thing is this, the Holy Spirit. Say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, a lot of us have... And a lot of churches have ostracized and marginalized the Holy Spirit. He's not welcome in churches, amen. And if you do that, you're positioning yourself, or you're, we're positioning ourselves for death. Why? He's the spirit of life. 
Bible says the law, the spirit of life, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He's the spirit of life. Paul talks of the same thing, him referring him as the spirit of life. Holy Spirit, look, the Holy Spirit is so critical, folks. When the Holy Spirit is in the church, there the, are the things that are impossible that turn around because of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Bible says that he who, Jesus, when he was speaking to Sardis, it says, he who has this, the Spirit, the sevenfold Spirit of God. So if you allow the Holy Spirit into a, an environment, he brings his wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, might. He brings the fear of the Lord. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So the Holy Spirit is critical. If you take the Holy Spirit out, then boom, suddenly the wisdom of God is taken out. The counsel of God is taken out. The might of God is taken out. All these things are taken out. And you remember what happened at creation. The Bible says the world was without form. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was. And then the Bible says but the Holy Spirit was hovering. The Spirit of God was hovering across the earth. And then when the word came, the Bible says God said, let there be light. Boom, it happened. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember that God showed Ezekiel a vision of a valley full of dry bones. And then, he went, and then God asked the question to Ezekiel. When God asks you a question, it's not that he doesn't know what the answer is. Okay, he says, can these dry bones live? And Ezekiel was smart. He said, you know, Lord. Right? You know. I agree with, uh, with Wendy. Most of us, we argue with God, you know. But he says, you know, Lord. Amen. And then God said, prophesy the word of the Lord to these dry bones. And then so he prophesied and prophesied and stuff like that. And stuff began to happen to these dry bones. And then finally, he said, God says, I will let the spirit of God breathe into this. And then they shall live. We need the Holy Spirit. We, that is why often we welcome, come Holy Spirit. We want him in here. Folks, we need him in here. If he's out, then there's, no, there's not going to be life. Amen. I want to ask a question. How much do you rely on the word of God? And how much do you rely on the Holy Spirit? Do you also ask him to speak to you? Do you take directions for, from, from him? Folks, it can save your life. Somebody, Wendy, took directions, says, leave now. So she took up and, you know, she argued a little bit, but she left. Praise God. It saved her life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit. Now, let's just get back to Sardis here. Jesus gave the solution for the dying church of Sardis. That's the thing about Jesus. He, he, he shows you a way out. He shows you a way out. I, need to, I just feel the Holy Spirit telling me right now that no temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. He will make a way of escape. Somebody's going through some stuff right now. God says there's a way of escape. Amen. That's a way of escape. Okay, but, but just show, just watch, watch what Jesus says here. Revelation chapter 3 verse 2 says, be watchful. So he's told them, folks, you have a name, you have a reputation, you're alive, but folks, you're dead. Then he tells them, be watchful. Say, be watchful. He tells them, be watchful. One version says, wake up. I kind of like that version, you know. Wake up. It's like, you know, you're, you've been sleeping for a while and, and then your wife kind of shoves you and says, wake up, honey. You know, Jesus is saying, wake up. All right? Then he says, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Really, he's saying, I have not found your works meeting the standards of God. Amen? Then he goes on in verse 3. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, hold fast and repent. Jesus is telling his church to repent. Change their thinking with corresponding actions. Therefore, if you will not watch, now this is the, the warning. If you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. So Jesus is now telling them what to do. He's telling them what to do. And he's warning them, if you don't do this, I'm going to come upon you, and it's going to be like a thief in the night. This was really, this was something that the church of Sardis would understand because, as I said earlier on, that city was in a, they, they let their guard down and uh, they, they, the invading army was just able to take the city like that. They were asleep, okay? Now, when it says be watchful or wake up, what does it mean? It means strengthen, uh, well, let me just mention the, the four areas. He said they should, be, they should be watchful, they should strengthen what remains, they should remember how you received and heard, and then they should repent. I'm just going to touch on being watchful. 
okay? Be watchful, wake up. That phrase would have been really familiar to this city, this city church, okay? Simply because of the history, all right? Now, a call by the Lord to wake up implies that somebody is asleep. You don't tell somebody who is awake to wake up. You tell somebody who is sleeping, okay? The Lord often tells his people to watch spiritually. When he says watch, he's talking about watching spiritually or to be alert spiritually. You, can, you can't be spiritually watchful if you are spiritually asleep. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? You can't be spiritually watchful, alert, if you're spiritually asleep. That's why he says wake up. That's why there's a call to wake up. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5. I say, be sober, be vigilant, be alert, okay? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Folks, whether you believe it or not, you have an enemy. And he's looking for somebody to devour. And that's why the Bible says, you got to be alert. It's talking about it spiritually. Spiritually alert. You got to be watchful. You got to be awake. Same thing Jesus says, be watchful. Remember in Gethsemane, when Jesus, uh, just before Jesus went to the cross, he, he goes with his disciples and he takes three of them, James, John, and, and Peter. He, 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 he takes them even further in and he says, can you watch with me? My soul is, is sorrowful. You know, can you watch with me? He's telling them, I want you guys to be praying. And so he goes out, uh, stone threw away and he prays and he travails and he comes back an hour later and the folks are asleep. And Jesus says, come on. Couldn't you watch and pray for one hour? <laughs> and then he said, you know, he understood. He said, look, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He says, get up, wake up, and pray. And he goes back, and he comes back, and he still sees them sleeping. They didn't see anything the second time. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But it means to be alert, spiritually alert. Now, notice that he says, he made, Jesus made this statement, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Okay, it's tying in with what Peter is saying. It ties in with what Paul says as well. One of the reasons why you have to be spiritually alert is because you're, you're, the enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That's why it's, need, it's needed for us to be spiritually alert. Now, I want to make this statement, and you can take it whichever way you want, but I believe it's true. A good barometer of your spiritual alertness is your prayer life. A good barometer or a good measure of your spiritual alertness, alertness is your prayer life. Are you one of those that watches and prays? Are you one of those that watches and prays? You see, when you look at the scripture, it says in, it, it's very tied with alertness. Prayer is very tied with alertness. That's why I make this statement. It, it, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Then it says, stay alert. You see the, the, the connection between prayer and alertness. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Watching and, so watching and praying is critical. He says, watch. He's talking about get up, be alert, be on your guard, pray, praise God. Now, watching also speaks of being ready and expectant. Say ready and expectant. So watching also signifies being ready and expectant. You can't be ready or spiritually expectant if you are spiritually asleep. You can't. And you know what? A lot of the church today is spiritually asleep. We're not expectant of Christ's return. We're not. But Jesus said, be watchful. I'll just read a few scriptures here to, to buttress this fact. Matthew 24, 42 says, keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Notice what Jesus is saying. He's coming back. So he says, keep watch. Be alert. Be spiritually alive. You got to be Alert of what, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what's happening. Keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. Then verse 44 says, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Are you ready for the Lord? Let's return. Are you living your life in anticipation? You know, he could come any moment now. So 
because of that awareness and that blessed hope, are you conducting your life knowing that when he comes, you'll be ready? Or at the back of your mind, are you thinking, well, he didn't come 2,000 years ago. It's another 2,000 years to go. And, and as a result, that reflects the way you live. Watchfulness symbolizes being ready, being expectant. Look at what, how do we get ready for the Lord? I just do a few things here and then we wrap it up. How do we get ready for the Lord? Luke chapter 12, verse 35. It says, be dressed ready for service. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. So be re dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that he will, when, when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door. Verse 37 says, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. When Jesus comes back, will he find you watching? Will he find you spiritually alert? Will he find you in a place of readiness? Will he find you prepared? Will he find you doing the things he's asked you to do? And then verse 38 says, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. So being ready is a question of being dressed for service, serving the master as best you can in everything you've been called to. Have you been called to be a mother? Serve him as a mother. Serve him as a father. Look over your children and give the best. Because that's what he's called. He's giving you a grace to be a mother. Grace to be a father. Grace to be a manager. Grace to be a worker. Wherever. You know the scripture that really ties this all together. Colossians 3.23. I didn't really bring that up. But, but uh, I didn't really put that in. Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord and not men. Whatever you do, do it as if you're doing it for the Lord. You're mopping the floor at that McDonald's. You're wondering about why they don't give you an increase. Mop the floor as unto the Lord. Because the Bible says there's an inheritance, an eternal inheritance, if you do everything as unto the Lord. McDonald's may not recognize you, but there's a reward for you, an eternal reward. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Whatever. Whatever. You're doing the dishes and you don't want to, do it as unto the Lord. I remember, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Just a few um, days ago, this whole pile of dishes, you know, and, and um, I thought, okay, let me do this. And I was doing it because it was a pile of dishes. And I, halfway through, I thought, oh, man, I'm robbing myself of some eternal rewards. I said, Lord, I'm now doing the dishes for you. <laughs> Amen. And so maybe I got half of the reward. Praise God. But whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Do it as unto the Lord. Not because of the boss. Not because of the raise. Do it as unto the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 4 says, But you, brethren, are you not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief? Paul is reference, making reference again to a bunch of Christians who may not be ready. We may not be prepared, okay? He says, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Let us watch and be alert. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Faith, love, and hope. Notice what he says. Let's put on the breastplate of faith and love, our motivation, our heart, from a place of faith, working through love. And it says, put on a helmet, our mind. We should be thinking of the blessed hope. That Jesus is coming again. And in our minds, we know he's coming again. It could be any moment now. So we are living our lives in anticipation of that blessed hope. Can you imagine what it would be like if we began to live in that preparedness? Where we, our actions are motiv motivated from a place of faith, working in love. And because we know Christ is returning soon, our actions, we're living in anticipation 
so that he does, for, for, so that when it does trumpet sounds, bless God, we're not surprised. Amen. We're not surprised. I'll be talking about the rapture soon. Amen. In fact, uh, a friend of mine, I'm a good pastor friend of mine. I was trying to get a hold of him for a whole week. Usually, we text each other, and and I wasn't getting a hold of him, you know. And uh, finally, um, and I was sending a lot of texts. I left some voice messages. I was getting quite concerned. I planned that if I don't hear from him today, I'll call his wife and find out what's up because it's very unusual. So I get a, a text message this, this morning. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. I actually traveled and everything. So I sent a message back. I said, I knew it was not the rapture. <laughs> because if it was the rapture, I would be up. Amen. But I said, May, I was beginning to think, have you been translated? Because you are so into prayer. Amen. Point being, we should be ready for the Lord's return. Can I hear a good amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this, th verse 35. Awake to righteousness. Awake. Be alert. Put on righteousness. And do not sin. It can't get clearer than that. Let's look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 13 in closing. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, 11 to 13 says, For the grace of God. Now, I'm talking about grace. I don't want you to think I'm being legalistic here. Notice what it says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And it says, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Grace teaches us to live right. Amen? And then let's go to verse 13, please. While we wait, this is the expectancy. This is the expectancy. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, maybe you're already ready. I want to encourage you to keep going. Keep going. Remain ready. Be alert. All right? Maybe you're dressed for service. You're watching. You're praying. I want to encourage you. Keep going. The Lord encouraged the remnant. He said, you know, he was happy with them. And he says, I'm proud of you. And he says, I'll, I'll boast about you before my Father in heaven. I'll not blot your names out of the Lamb's book of life. You know, so, so, he, so, so keep going. I want to encourage those. But if you acknowledge that you're not spiritually alert, you've let down your guard. And God is saying, wake up. God is saying, you've got to be watchful. How many of you know that these are the end times? You just have to look around and hear the news. These are the end times. Some of the stuff that is happening around the earth, it's, I remember I was lamenting once about how, man, there's so much darkness across the earth. And the Lord led me once again to Isaiah chapter 60 and says, Arise, shine, your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And it goes on and it says, Though darkness covers the earth, and great darkness, the people. It says, but glory to God. It says, the Lord's glory will come upon you. His light will be upon you. But it's for you and I to arise. We got to wake up. Say, wake up. We got to be watchful. Say, watchful. Amen. So that was a message to his church. Now, I've just dealt with the watchful part. And another sermon I'll do is some of the other parts. But I believe God wants us to be watchful. I pray that, I don't know what Jesus would say if he came, you know, if he was to send us a letter. I don't know what he would say. But I sure hope he wouldn't say, oh, you have a name of being alive, but you're dead. I hope he doesn't say that. We've got to be spiritually alert. Folks, we've got to be. We've got to watch and pray. It's incredible how in the church today, prayer meetings are one of the least attended meetings. And for men, men, we got to take the lead in prayer. You come to prayer meetings and most of the time it's just women. And f I like women, amen. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. Let me, let me explain what I mean by I like women. Oh, God. Somebody would just take that clip and say, pastor says he likes women. Oh, praise the Lord. You know what I mean. I have nothing against women. We, God made us in his image. Women are made in the image of God. But what, men, we should be taking the lead, even in our homes, concerning prayer. Amen. Amen. We should. Is it because we're spiritually sleeping? Jesus says, be watchful and wake up. You've got to be spiritually alert. 
You got to be. And you know what? You may not know Jesus at all. In this particular scripture, it talks about a book of life. Notice what it says, a book of life. Only those who have given their hearts to Jesus Christ are going to have their names in that book of life. Have you given your heart to the, to the Lord, Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he came and he died and he was raised on the third day? If you do believe that and you believe that indeed you're a sinner, that's the reason why he came, then the instant you say yes to Jesus, guess what? Your name is written in the book of life for all eternity. But you have to say, yes, Jesus. You have to say that. You have to acknowledge that, you know what, I've missed the mark. I've fallen short. I haven't lived to God's standards. And the good news is that Jesus Christ, he came to do it all for us. Our inability to, to, to do the law, to fulfill the law. Jesus fulfilled that, uh, that law. Amen. And all we have to do now is by faith accept what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. That's all. And when we accept him into our lives, he takes us on a journey. Do you want to go on that journey? So that your name is also in, written in that Lamb's book of life. I want to give you an opportunity today. So for those who know in their hearts, you know what, pastor, I've been spiritually sleeping. Pastor, I've not been as alert as I should be. I've not been watching and praying. I've not been as ready as I could be. This is not said in any way, form of condemnation, no. But it is said to encourage you to arise. That's what it's set for. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up front really quickly. And as they come, I want you to bow your heads. Bow your heads. Bow your heads. And I want this to be a sailor moment where you just think and reflect a little bit. Just think and reflect a little bit on what has been said. What kind of stuck out to you? What was highlighted to you by the Holy Spirit? Reflect on it. Reflect on it. Reflect. And perhaps you are not yet a Christian, but you feel a tag from the inside. You want to become a Christian. You acknowledge, first of all, that you've ne not met the standards of God. And you acknowledge also that. You believe that Jesus came and died for you on the cross of Calvary. And on the third day, he was raised up. If you believe that, and you want to give your heart to the Lord, there is opportunity today to do that. And I'm not going to let that opportunity pass you by. If that's you, just slip up your hand right now in Jesus' name. If you would like to give your hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ, just slip up your hand and I will pray with you. Is there anybody here? Anybody? Praise God. Praise God. I want us all to stand up, please. I want you to lift up your hands to heaven. I'm going to pray. And if this is, the heart, if this is your heart's prayer as well, I want you to just agree with me and just say amen as loudly 
And as often as you want. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne of grace and mercy. Thank you for your word to your churches. Thank you for the word you gave to the church of Sardis. The church that stirred, that you stirred to be alive, to wake up, to be watchful, to strengthen the thing that remain, to be to strengthen the things that they receive first, oh God, to repent of slumber. Thank you to because of your love that you spoke to your beloved church. I know your word has spoken to your beloved this day. I ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, would you stare us by your spirit? Stare us by your word. Be watchful to wake up, to be spiritually alert in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us. You know the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. We're asking Holy Spirit to help us. You are the helper. Help us to be alert. Help us to revitalize our prayer language, to revitalize our prayer time with you, to revitalize our study of your word. Help us to be clothed with service. Help us to think of your imminent return, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we praise you. Lord, we honor you. Lord, we glorify you. In the matchless name of Jesus, and all God's people together said, Amen.